of the Women and Foreign Policy Program at the Council on Foreign Relations in Washington, D.C. She previously served in the Department of State uh, as uh, Director of Policy and Senior Advisor in the Office of Global Women's Issues, advising Secretary Hillary Clinton on women's issues in U.S. foreign policy. Uh, she also serves currently on Secretary Clinton's presidential campaign. Do go vote right outside next door. Uh, but she uh, reminded me to remind you all that she's speaking in her capacity at the CFR, not as a campaign spokesman. Um, previous or while, while she's at the State Department, she also uh, represented the State Department as a member of the White House Council on Women and Girls, and she worked with then Senator Clinton in a similar capacity, advising her uh, during her Senate years. Please join me in welcoming Rachel Bolkestein. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, and uh, thank you to the Clinton Center for National Security uh, for inviting me to be here today. I also want to thank the University of Texas at Austin for its commitment to examining the issue of women in national security and shining a light on this critical topic. Most importantly, I want to thank all of you for participating in the discussion today. Uh, as was stated, my name is Rachel Vogelstein, and I direct the Women in Foreign Policy Program at the Council on Foreign Relations. And today, I'm going to propose to answer three fundamental questions on the topic of gender and U.S. foreign policy. The first, what is the status of women and girls around the world in 2016? Second, why does the status of women and girls matter to U.S. foreign policy interests? And third, if indeed it does matter, what can the U.S. actually do to advance this interest? So let's start by exploring the status of women and girls across the globe. And I will begin with the following radical proposition, which is that there has never been a better time in history to be born female. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking. If you open the newspaper on any given day, you are liable to read about the following. Girls attacked with acid in South Asia simply for going to school. Or women subject to rape used as a tool of war in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, mothers who die from largely preventable conditions related to pregnancy and childbirth in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, female revelers subject to sexual attacks in a public square on New Year's Eve in Western Europe. These and so many other crimes and harmful practices speak to deeply embedded norms and attitudes that are seemingly intractable and that have quite literally been around since the beginning of recorded human history. So how can it possibly be with daily news headlines like these that there has never been a better time in which to be born female? Well, in fact, a data-driven review of the past 20 years shows that the status of women and girls has actually improved considerably. And the pace of change we have seen over that time period demonstrates that these issues are not, in fact, intractable. And indeed, the data show that progress is possible and has been achieved in a very short period of time. So I'll date this review back 20 years to capture progress for women following the 1995 United Nations Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing, where 189 nations gathered to declare with one voice that women's rights are human rights and where countries the world over adopted an ambitious platform for action that called for, quote, the full and equal participation of women in political, civil, economic, social, and cultural life. Since that time, we have seen tremendous headway made in advancing the status of women and girls through legal frameworks and institutions. There are a record number of countries that have now put laws prohibiting discrimination or violence against women on the books, meaning that there is a new cohort of women and girls growing up with rights that their mothers did not enjoy. Multilateral institutions have also elevated the rights of women in important ways. So for example, in 2000, the United Nations Security Council passed Resolution 1325, 
which called for women's participation in peace and security processes. The Security Council also passed Resolution 1820, which declares that rape and other forms of sexual violence can constitute war crimes or crimes against humanity. Forums like the G8, now the G7, uh, have recently prioritized issues like maternal mortality. And international institutions, like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, now invest in women as engines of economic growth. These are significant policy shifts. We have also seen concrete progress in a few sectors, including health and education, which shows that we can, in fact, change outcomes for women when we set collective goals, promote accountability, and dedicate sufficient resources. So let's consider the area of women's health. The rate of maternal mortality, which previously stood at half a million women every year, essentially has been cut in half over the past two decades. This is in no small part due to the elevation of this issue on the international agenda in the year 2000, when the international community adopted a target through a set of international development objectives called the Millennium Development Goals that aimed to reduce maternal mortality by two-thirds by 2015. What was once overlooked as a, quote, women's issue rose in prominence to the degree that the UN Secretary General himself, Ban Ki-moon, created and led a signature initiative called Every Woman, Every Child to make addressing largely preventable conditions related to pregnancy and childbirth part of his legacy. Or let's consider the area of education. In just 20 years time, a significant gender gap in primary school has virtually closed on a global level. That means an entire generation of girls all around the world now has the chance to go to school. This progress too was spurred in part due to a commitment in the Millennium Development Goals to eliminate the gender disparity in primary schooling. Now, I don't want to overstate the progress that has taken place in the areas of legal rights for women or with respect to women's health and education. Much more work remains to be done, for example, in the area of legal rights as women continue to face gender-based job restrictions in well over 100 economies around the world or in the area of family planning, where we know that over 200 million women lack access to modern methods of contraception. Or in girls' secondary education, where over 30 million girls around the world remain out of school at the secondary level. But while there is certainly more work to do, these gains do show us that we have and can make significant progress on issues that are too often seen as intractable. And this progress helps explain why there has never been a better time to be born female than today. As the headlines I referred to earlier tell us, however, it is not all roses and sunshine for the world's women and girls. Indeed, over the past two decades, we've seen comparatively less progress in three areas that I'd like to highlight for you today. Economic participation, political and civic participation, and security. So first, let's discuss economic participation. Two decades after the Beijing conference, the highest echelons of the economic sphere remain largely male. And despite the gains in girls' education, women's labor force participation has stagnated over the past three decades, actually dropping from 57% to 55% globally, despite the strong evidence that women's economic participation benefits entire families, communities, and economies. In that same period, the gap between men's and women's labor force participation has remained virtually unchanged. And we know there is a gender wage gap that persists in every country in the world for which we have recorded data, including right here in the United States. Second, let's consider the issue of political participation. 20 years after the Beijing conference, women continue to be underrepresented almost everywhere, filling less than a quarter of parliamentary seats around the world. The number of countries with a female head of state has risen from 12 in 1995 to only 18 today. And in a world with 193 UN member nations, 18 is not a number to call home about. While we've seen some progress in places like Latin America, where women have made 
some gains, particularly at the head of state level, or in a post-conflict country like Rwanda, where women actually comprise half of the parliament. In general, the pace of change with respect to political participation has been far too slow. And finally, women have made little progress in the area of security, which I define to include both participation in national and local peace and security processes, and also to include personal security, or freedom from violence. Fifteen years after the passage of UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on advancing women's participation in peace and security efforts, and five years after the adoption of a US National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security, which was implemented by executive order of the president, far too little progress has been made on women's inclusion at the peace table. From Kabul to Kinshasa, women continue to be marginalized and excluded from peace and security processes, despite facing unique threats to their safety and well-being. As of 2015, only one woman, Miriam Coronel Ferrer of the Philippines, has ever led a government negotiation in a formal peace process. Strategies to counter violent extremism still overlook the role that women can play in combating radicalization, as well as the rising number of women who have been radicalized themselves around the world, an omission that is gravely concerning in the wake of the San Bernardino attacks, which involved a female combatant. And the atrocities of conflict that disproportionately affect women, such as rape as a tool of war, persist with impunity. Evidence also shows that violence against women and girls continues to be an epidemic. While the data collection on this issue is incomplete, a recent global study estimates that over 35% of women worldwide have experienced intimate partner violence, and violence remains one of the most common abuses of women's human rights around the world, including right here in the United States, as we saw even in this weekend's Oscar ceremony, for those of you who tuned in, uh, which recognized survivors of sexual assault and invited them onto the stage. So what can we take away from 20 years worth of data about the status of women and girls? First, that while gender inequalities may be deeply rooted, they are not insurmountable. Progress is possible and in fact has been made in record time in the areas of health, education, and legal rights. We also learn, however, that despite this progress, considerable unfinished business remains, particularly with respect to women's economic participation, political participation, and security. So why does this unfinished business matter? Well, now that we've reviewed the status of women and girls around the world and identified some of the gaps that still <coughs> remain, I want to move on to answer the next question. Why addressing gender gaps matters to US foreign policy interests? And at the outset, I want to note that I take the question of why gender equality matters to US interests very seriously. We live at a time of rising threats that have disrupted conventional diplomatic and security strategy and pose significant risks that all of us feel, whether we sit at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue or whether we're simply boarding an airplane for a trip. In a post-9-11 world, we know that it is more important than ever to justify the expenditure of US time and resources in the foreign policy and national security arenas to ensure that we are ruthlessly and efficiently prioritizing policies and programs that will keep us prosperous and safe. And it is precisely under these terms that I offer my second radical proposition. And it is that advancing the rights of women and girls through US foreign policy is not just the right thing to do, it is the smart thing to do. Now, I don't want to minimize the power of the moral argument in support of gender equality. When you consider evidence that one in three women around the world have experienced physical or sexual violence in their lifetimes, that an estimated 20 million people are trafficked and trapped in modern slavery, that five million girls are forced to marry under the age of 15 every year. It is hard to hear figures like that and not to feel a sense of moral outrage and to fight for the human rights of every woman and girl. And indeed, human rights advocates have labored since the Universal Declaration 
of Human Rights was adopted by the United Nations in Paris in 1948 to expand the notion of human rights, to include the violation of the rights of women and girls. While the Universal Declaration included language to make clear that the rights and freedoms contained therein are to be afforded without distinction of any kind, including on the basis of sex, it was not until close to five decades later at the UN Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing that nations began to accept the idea that, in fact, women's rights are human rights, that it is a violation not only of women's rights, but of human rights when women are burned to death because their marriage dowries are deemed too small, that it is a violation not only of women's rights, but of human rights when women are subject to rape as a prize of war, that it is a violation not only of women's rights, but of human rights when young girls are forced to endure the painful practice of genital mutilation. It took 50 years for that shift to take place, from seeing violence against women as cultural to then seeing it as criminal, from viewing women's issues as ancillary to human rights to understanding women's rights as fundamental human rights. And this moral case, while much more accepted today, continues to need to be made. But as important as the moral human rights-based case is, that is not the only reason to care about equality for women around the globe. And indeed, in the dangerous and interconnected 21st century world in which we live, the moral case simply may not be convincing enough for some to put it high on the foreign policy agenda. In 2016, however, we have compelling evidence that advancing the status of women and girls is not simply just. It is, in fact, a strategic imperative and one that we overlook to our peril. Today, there's a growing body of evidence that demonstrates why promoting gender equality advances critical US foreign policy interests, including prosperity, stability, and peace. Consider, for example, the issue of economic growth. Leading international financial institutions and private sector corporations have concluded that when women participate in the economy, poverty decreases, and GDP grows. Economists at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, estimate that closing the gap in women's labor force participation across OECD countries will lead to gains of 12% by 2030, including an estimated 20% in Japan and Korea, and an estimated 22% in Italy. The World Economic Forum, which is not exactly known as a bastion of feminist theory, now puts out an annual gender gap report, which measures the gap between men and women in a given country in terms of economic participation, political participation, access to education, and health survivability. This analysis from the World Economic Forum shows that the countries in which the gender gap is closest to being closed are those that are more economically prosperous and secure. These results have been mirrored in analyses from the private sector. Just last fall, McKinsey released a study assessing the potential gain of gender equality in workforce participation at $28 trillion globally, or put another way, at about 26% of annual global gross domestic product, just if the gap between men and women were to close by 2025. Think about that. At a time when the international community is struggling to recover from an economic downturn that has roiled markets and sown unrest from Athens to Addis, we are literally leaving trillions of dollars of economic potential on the table. Research also supports the notion that women's economic participation matters not only at the macro level, but also at the micro level, as studies suggest that women are more likely to use resources to benefit their families and communities for health expenses, for education, for sanitation. And this has a discernible multiplier effect. To ignore the barriers to women's economic participation is to forfeit these critical development benefits. So the relationship then between gender equality and economic prosperity is clear and it is strong. Evidence also demonstrates a relationship between gender equality and security. 
Indeed, it is no accident that the nations in the world where we see the most instability and conflict are also nations where women are most likely to be denied their fundamental human rights. Recent studies support the proposition that inclusive peace negotiations are more likely to endure. And research shows that women offer unique contributions to making and keeping peace. They are more likely to raise issues in peace processes that help societies reconcile, rebuild, and achieve a sustainable resolution. According to research conducted by the International Crisis Group in Sudan, Congo, and Uganda, women who participate in peace talks often invoke issues like human rights, like security, justice, employment, education, and health care, all topics that are fundamental to reconciliation and rebuilding, and therefore to a lasting and sustainable peace. It is common sense that representative inclusivity in conflict resolution will generate an agreement that is more likely to be acceptable to all parties and therefore more likely to endure. But a diversity of views and experiences at the table can also help strengthen the negotiation process itself. Take the example of the 2006 negotiations that took place in Darfur. Male negotiators had deadlocked over control of a particular river going around and around without any end in sight. The women who had been excluded from the negotiations eventually demanded to know where they stood. Upon learning about the deadlock over this river, they pointed out that the river at issue, a place where women once congregated to fetch water and wash clothes, responsibilities that traditionally fall to women, had in fact dried up many years before. The bottom line here is not only that women bring unique and critical perspectives to the table, it is also that including women can improve the process itself and contribute to more durable agreements. And conversely, excluding women from the table means omitting the entirety of the experience, information, and talent that they could otherwise bring to bear. So the evidence is overwhelming, and the verdict is now in. Nations in the 21st century simply cannot get ahead if half of their population is left behind. And over the past two decades, as awareness of this evidence-based case in support of gender equality has grown, so too have the US foreign policies to support it. Indeed, an historic and unprecedented policy framework on gender equality and U.S. foreign policy has been developed in recent years. Leaders from Secretary of State Madeleine Albright to Secretary Condoleezza Rice to Secretary Hillary Clinton to our current Secretary John Kerry have all emphasized that women are critical to solving virtually every challenge we face as individual nations and as a community of nations. Women are now more likely to be at the center of our diplomacy and development efforts, not simply as beneficiaries but as agents of change, of peace, of reconciliation, development, growth, and stability. Today, the line between hard power, meaning sanctions and military force, and what's known as soft power, or using diplomatic and development tools to promote democracy, governance, health, education, and human rights, that line has blurred. And many of today's diplomats and policy experts now promote what Harvard professor Joseph Nye calls smart power, a combination of both strategies that recognizes the importance of each. One emblem of this shift is the current US national security strategy, which explicitly recognizes that countries are more peaceful and prosperous when women are accorded full and equal rights and opportunity. And when those rights and opportunities are denied, countries lag behind. This emphasis is also reflected by policy guidance issued by our past two Secretaries of State, highlighting the importance of gender equality to U.S. diplomacy and foreign assistance, and outlining the ways in which every bureau in Washington and every embassy around the world can incorporate this lens into its work. Even the existence of an Office of Global Women's Issues within the State Department itself, which was started in the Clinton administration, elevated in the Bush administration, and elevated further and made permanent by executive order in the Obama administration, that office itself is a sign that women's issues are no longer ancillary, but instead are core to the work of the department. 
By reaching out to women and girls and integrating them into our diplomatic mission, we ensure more effective diplomacy, whether driving economic growth, resisting extremism, safeguarding human rights, or promoting political solutions. Perhaps the clearest example of this newfound commitment to gender equality as a strategic objective of U.S. foreign policy is the commitment of the State Department to integrating this issue into the Foreign Service Institute curriculum, which provides training for new and established diplomats. A decade ago, women's issues would have been considered ancillary to the hard foreign policy concerns like prosperity, security, and stability. Today, all incoming Foreign Service officers are taught not only why advancing gender equality around the world advances U.S. interests, but also the many ways in which diplomats can and should integrate this lens into their work. So you've heard some of the evidence that supports elevating the status of women and girls as a strategic imperative for the United States. And you've heard a little bit about what the U.S. is doing to advance this interest but you still may not be entirely convinced. Sure, increasing women's labor force participation rates around the world may spur economic growth, thereby promoting prosperity and stability around the world, both core U.S. interests. Or, yes, including women's perspectives in peace negotiations may improve the durability of peace agreements, thereby promoting our security interests around the world. But, you may be thinking, what about cultural issues? which reflect deeply rooted social norms that govern the ways in which people live their daily lives. How do harmful traditional practices, which undermine the rights of individual women and girls overseas, actually affect the interests of U.S. citizens here at home? Well, to answer that question, I'd like to offer a case study on the practice of child marriage and outline how and why this practice affects U.S. foreign policy interests. This is an issue I've written about at the Council on Foreign Relations and addressed in my previous capacity at the State Department, and it provides a clear example of why the status of women and girls in other nations around the world relates to basic U.S. foreign policy concerns. So I'll begin with a bit of background on child marriage, which is far more prevalent than most people realize. The number of women married as children is quite staggering. The UN estimates that one in three women age 20 to 24, that's about 70 million, were married under the age of 18. And we know that many are far younger than that. Nearly 5 million girls are married under the age of 15 each year, which is about 13,000 per day. And some of these girls are married as young as 8 or 9 years old. This is a practice that occurs across regions, across cultures, across religions. India accounts for about 40% of the world's known child brides. And this tradition is pervasive elsewhere in South Asia, across Sub-Saharan Africa, and in parts of Latin America and the Middle East. In my writing, I've made the case that ending the practice of child marriage is not just a moral imperative, it is a strategic imperative with broad implications for US foreign policy goals. Now once again, I don't want to minimize the power of the moral argument. There is a report I wrote on this topic, which has a photograph on its cover of a child bride in Yemen. This is a photograph captured by the renowned photographer Stephanie Sinclair. This picture, taken in 2010, is of an eight-year-old girl named Tahani and her 27-year-old husband. Tahani recalled of this picture and of the early days of her marriage, quote, whenever I saw him, I hid. I hated to see him. Looking at a photograph of an eight-year-old girl with a grown man as a husband, I think that few in this room would dispute that the practice of child marriage is abhorrent. But why should we care about the fate of this young girl in the developing world? Well, the answer, it turns out, is not simply morality or justice. It is also self-interest, because what happens to an individual girl affects the stability of her family, her community, her economy and her nation, which in turn has broad implications for U.S. foreign policy. So consider, for example, the U.S. foreign policy interest in economic growth. Research suggests that child marriage often curtails education for young girls, which not only undercuts their potential, but it also stifles economic progress. 
even one extra year of schooling beyond the average can increase women's wages by 10 to 20 percent. And a World Bank study suggests that a one percentage point increase in the share of women with a secondary education actually raises a country's annual per capita income growth. These benefits vanish from the global economy when girls' education is cut short by marriage. Girls are also more likely to become single mothers through divorce, abandonment, or widowhood, so through the avenue of marriage, than they are to become single mothers through out-of-wedlock births, which I think runs contrary to a lot of the predispositions that folks might have. And this creates an intergenerational cycle of poverty that becomes incredibly difficult to break. Consider the issue of global health, another top priority in U.S. foreign assistance. Evidence shows that early marriage begets early pregnancy and childbearing, which is a leading cause of death for girls age 15 to 19 in the developing world. And even when young mothers do survive, the health of their children is often jeopardized. Stillbirths and infant mortality are 50% more likely when mothers are under the age of 20 and the risks of prematurity, of low birth weights, uh, and childhood malnutrition all increase as well. These poor health outcomes undercut substantial U.S. investments in global health and foster poverty and instability. Consider even how the practice of child marriage is associated with security. Research suggests that child marriage is correlated with instability. One analysis shows that most of the 25 countries with the highest prevalence of child marriage are either fragile states or at high risk of natural disaster. And we see reports from war-torn states such as Syria or Afghanistan or drought-stricken countries like Niger, which confirm that families often pursue child marriage in an attempt to preserve resources in crisis situations. And yet we know that perpetuation of this practice in weak states only exacerbates poverty, illiteracy, poor health, and instability in places that are already overwhelmed by complex challenges. Disregard for the rule of law is another security issue. Ignoring minimum age of marriage laws undermines the rule of law. An attempted enforcement of these laws, which exist almost everywhere in the world, can be met not only with indifference, but sometimes even with violence, which is itself corrosive to the rule of law overall. So the evidence makes clear that child marriage is not just a moral issue. It is a strategic issue that US diplomats and development experts ignore at the peril of the very agendas they are working tirelessly to promote. And that is why we have taken on this issue at the Council on Foreign Relations and it is why eliminating this practice deserves to remain high on the international agenda. And indeed, it is not only in the United States that this issue has risen in prominence. This past fall at the United Nations, in part due to the leadership of the United States, the international community for the first time ever adopted a time-bound target to end the practice of child marriage by 2030 as part of the new Sustainable Development Framework that seceded the Millennium Development Goals when they expired last year. And government officials in nations around the world have begun to take note, to reform and implement their laws, to help shift norms, and to invest in programs that expand opportunities not only for girls and women, but for entire communities and societies. It is these changes and the growing recognition that elevating the status of women and girls improves outcome for us all, that gives me hope. Because the case that I have made has reverberated through the corridors of power in Washington and in capitals all around the world. And its strength is beginning to change not only hearts and minds, but also policies, and importantly, budgets. And so I will leave you with one final radical proposition as I conclude my remarks today which actually hangs on my office wall in Washington. And it is, people who say it can't be done will not stop the people who are doing it. There are plenty of skeptics out there, but the evidence is in, it continues to grow, and at this point it is too compelling to ignore any longer. That's why we see Prime Minister Shinzo Abe of Japan, a conservative leader in a traditional society, 
embracing policies to increase women's labor force participation as a key pillar of his economic growth strategy. He knows that if Japanese women were employed at the same rate as men, the country's GDP could increase by nearly 13%. It is why Stefan de Mistura, the UN Special Envoy in Syria, recently appointed an advisory group of women to inform the tenuous peace process in that conflict-ridden country because he knows that including women in peace and security processes is not only a matter of fairness, but also a strategic advantage as women are more likely to collaborate across sectarian and cultural divides. It is why Prime Minister Narendra Modi of India has sought to position himself as a champion on behalf of women and girls, launching a social media campaign to combat harmful social norms that privilege boys over girls and which underlie practices from child marriage to gender bias sex selection to violence against women. And it is why the last three consecutive presidential administrations have elevated the rights of women and girls as part of U.S. foreign policy. We still need to make this case, and we still need to improve policies, reform laws, increase financial support, and strengthen political will. But regardless of who governs our country next, the strategic imperative in support